For me, the best thing about Creative Computing Institute is the sense of community that we're creating. This is one of the few places in the world where you can see things from an arts perspective and also a science and technology perspective at the same time. And that means that together everyone is talking about something they can't really talk about anywhere else. I studied at um, University of Arts London. I was like the techie person in like traditional design environments where maybe some of the things I needed or the spaces, the conversations I wanted to have did not exist. So when I knew that the CCI was being created, I was always trying to find ways and how I can get involved. This is the first cohort of students in the program. I've been really impressed at how much they've taken the materials we've given them and, and made them their own. Every time I come in the building, the students are just like chomping at the bit to show their work to people. I think it'll be a very, very good career for them. So I'm showing my first project on the diploma. I thought it would be interesting to explore what well, if we could see in sound rather than light. So I did the week-long machine learning course and the p5.js course with the CCI and it's really helped me sort of develop my practice and teach me more of the development side of coding. It's really changed my mind about like what computation is, what it means to the world, what it means like, to society at large. Like, in the course of a year, I've like, really changed how I'm thinking about it. We have a beautiful mission and a great social agenda, and we really want to positively impact the way tech works in society. I think of computing as a craft exercise, like pottery or weaving. It's going to take you a long time to become a master of it, but the first steps should be approachable by anyone. And I think that's an important part of what we do here at CCI. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and welcome to this open day session at the Creative Computing Institute. My name is Georgina Caldevila and I am the Creative Learning Producer at CCI. And today we are here to talk about our new exciting course, MA Internet Equalities. And I'm super happy to say that we've got with us Dr. Charlotte Webb, who developed this course, and also Dr. Craft, who is joining uh, the CCI now as a course leader of MA Internet Equalities. So to give you a bit of an overview of how this session is structured, we're going to start talking a little bit more about the CCI, what spaces, resources, and facilities are available to CCI students. And then Dr. Craft will take it over and talk a little bit about their background, what's the new role that they're taking at uh, CCI, also the approach of this new MA Internet Equalities. And then Dr. Charlotte Webb will join us online and talk a little bit more in detail about the course mm, units, the course structure, who is it aimed at, and then we will have the chance to receive any questions that you might have about the course and have an open Q&A in the end of the session. So we encourage you to be as active as you wish to just make sure that whatever questions, doubts that you have about the course or the CCI are solved and we can all talk about it online today. And then in terms of accessibility, just a note that the platform that we're using today, Blackboard Collaborate, doesn't display live captions. So if you have difficulties following along the session, just know that all this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded on our YouTube and we will send you a link after the session in a few weeks time. So you can rewatch or if you missed this, a detail, you can just go through it all again. So yes, don't worry if you meet, if you miss anything. Um, so yeah, let's get this started. I'm gonna start by sharing a video that I put together in which I explain you all you need to know about the space that we have at CCI and all the resources and, and facilities that are, are available to current students. So yes, let's get this started. Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to show you around the campus and share some of the facilities and resources available to CCI students. The Creative Computing Institute is located at UAL's Peckham Road campus in Camberwell, South East London. The local area is home to a thriving art scene, which hosts a variety of art galleries and artist studios that students, graduates and staff work and exhibit in. On site, there are two galleries, Camberwell Space and the Student Union Gallery, with the South London Gallery right next door and Peckham platform in the local area. 
also on site we have an amazing library supported by a dedicated CCI librarian who oversees the subject area of creative computing, ensuring the library stays up to date with the books, periodicals, databases and other resources you need to complete your studies. The CCI is located across the 4th and 5th floor of the newest building at Peckham Road, which means it's very accessible to students with various needs. Let's take a look around. The CCI is divided into four main areas. At the heart of the space is the kitchen. At lunchtime, it becomes a social hub of CCI for folks to share lunch together and during classes, it's quite a working space. Along the side are three classrooms, two seminar rooms and one high-end computer suite fitted with some of the latest technology, including 24 high-spec computers with NVIDIA RTX 2080 graphics cards and 4K monitors for working on projects ranging from machine learning to 3D rendering and video editing. Additionally, many of these computers can actually be accessed remotely from home after hours to enable access to specialist software or the high performance for rendering or machine learning work. In addition to the computing facilities, we have dedicated spaces set up for electronics, soldering, 3D printing and virtual reality facilities. Elsewhere within the building, CCI students have access to the 3D workshop, which includes additional 3D printing facilities, laser cutting, CNC machining, and a full wood workshop. We take COVID-19 safety very seriously, so at the moment our spaces are reconfigured to enable students to spread out two meters apart. There's also loads of windows to ensure good ventilation and hand and surface sanitizer throughout the space to keep things clean on top of regular visits from cleaning staff. In normal times, we also operate a laptop locker system where students can borrow a laptop to use within the CCI spaces. This is just a glimpse of the amazing resources and facilities that are gonna be available for you while studying at CCI. Now, I would like to briefly talk about the CCI social mission and public program. At CCI, we aim to integrate computational thinking with approaches to fairness and equality for the UAL and wider community. This is formally codified through our social mission, which focuses on diversity in technology, digital inclusion and entrepreneurship. Our public program is underpinned by this mission and connects students, practitioners and researchers with an international community of creative computing professionals. The aim of the public program is to offer a platform where UAL students, staff and industry people can explore creative technology through workshops, public events, intensive courses and fellowships awarded to practitioners in the field. To give you a sense of what you have the chance to take part in while studying at CCI, here are some of the programs that we've run. CCI's inaugural fellowship in 2018 was awarded to Feminist Internet. We run a series of workshops exploring the idea of a feminist Alexa. Our second fellowship was awarded to creativeapplications.net in which we delved into creative coding with custom LED displays and innovative ways to apply to new technologies. CCI awarded its third fellowship to artist and researcher Anna Riddler. Together we run a learning program called Artificial AI, where we explored some of the problematics embedded in datasets. In parallel, we run several week-long intensive courses open to all UAL students, which included inclusive design in wearable technology, designing a feminist chatbot, computational thinking with P5.js, machine learning for the creative industries, design with data and interactive machine learning, and the latest one we run, querying voice AI transcendent design. We also started the CCI After School Club, now renamed Tech Yard, a safe space aimed at young people, families and beginners based in the local area in Peckham and Camberwell, who want to learn creative computing in a supportive environment. This is just a quick overview of all the opportunities that we've been able to provide to UAL and CCI students over the last two years. But there are so many exciting things that are on the way and that we cannot wait for you to take part in. Thanks so much for watching and listening. I hope you enjoyed what you just seen and now let's keep moving.
Hello again. Apologies if there was a bit of a lag in the video we just played. I hope you found that useful to give you a little bit of an overview of how the CCI operates and how the spaces are. So now I would like to invite Dr. Pixcraft to join us online. We can't wait to hear a little bit more about you and what you're going to be taking at CCI. So over to you, Pix. Thanks so much, Georgina. Uh, can you all hear me OK? Yes. Oh, wonderful. I am going to share my screen. Um, I've just practiced this, so it should be no problem. There it is. Can you all see my slides now? Mm. Wonderful. Uh, let me know if there's any issue. Um, Hi, my name is Dr. Peekscraft, and I am so excited to be here with you all today. Uh, this is my first time uh, giving this kind of presentation, and I would I would be joining you all uh, in this new program next year as 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 the first cohort of this exciting new MA in Internet Equalities. Uh, today, I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of. Uh, myself and and my own background uh, as as your first point of contact in the program, uh, and then talk a little bit about what what I can what I envision uh, the the program doing for you all uh, before passing it on to to my colleague uh, Dr. Charlotte Webb. I don't know if you all know what a, what a course leader is or what a course leader does, so I thought I could just give a little bit of an overview of what my role would be. Uh, I I'm first and foremost interested in ensuring that you all have a positive experience in the program, uh, but I also have some responsibilities around shaping the curriculum, selecting instructors for the, the, the various courses, as well as doing some teaching myself. A little bit about me. I am new to the University of Arts London, and it's been a bit of a, a twisty path to get all the way here. I, as you might be able to tell from my accent, am from the United States. I grew up in Massachusetts. I started my career and my education, uh, my higher education, at a community college, which, which in England you would call a further education college called Massasoit Community College. Uh, and from there, it's really been a journey uh, through all sorts of different institutions. I, started quite local there in this further education institute and continued on to regional uh, regional school the university of massachusetts amherst uh, where i started to get involved in thinking about statistics and mathematics and later uh, computer science and technology uh, that brought me into my graduate education uh, which which i focused on computer science and especially computer science applied to the social sciences or how we can use data to understand the, the social world and society and from mit i kind of branched out into a few different things uh, i was trained as a computer scientist but nowadays i introduce myself more often as a disillusioned computer scientist uh, because when i joined uh, the Data and Society Research Institute in New York as a, as a visiting postdoctoral scholar and the University of Washington as, as a postdoctoral fellow, I, I learned a lot about uh, some of the different downsides of the technology that, that has been built in, in the last decade or so and really started to focus more on the critique of the kinds of methods that I had been studying before. That has led me then to do some of my own uh, spin-off work in a, in a nonprofit called the Critical Platform Studies Group, which, which I'll mention a little bit more about in a second, uh, as well as continuing my academic career uh, at Oxford, uh, where I have been most recently at the, the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, and now the University of Arts London, where I'm really excited by this new course that I'll tell you all about in a moment. Just to give you a little bit more context of the kinds of things that, that I do personally, uh, my, my work focuses on thinking about tech and society and the kinds of intersections of these two topics. As I mentioned, though, I started out as just more of a pure technologist. Uh, I had most of my formal training in statistics 
in statistical machine learning. And I initially was applying those kinds of ideas to understanding collective intelligence and the wisdom of crowds from a kind of organizational science lens. That organizational science work led me to move towards understanding more about society than developing uh, methods and, and working in, in the areas of machine learning and AI. And in, in recent years, I've done more work along the lines of human computer interaction, thinking about platform design, thinking about disinformation. One of my uh, favorite projects or one of the projects that I've had the most fun with has been thinking about the flat earther community uh, and, and how the flat earther community has been supported by different information technologies, as well as now more recently on the, on the, on, on the more critical side, thinking about topics like how in the United States, uh, the organizations like DARPA, which is one of the main defense funding agencies contribute to the academic military industrial complex there and how the types of methods that are common in, in areas like machine learning and AI are, are oriented uh, in many cases uh, towards goals that either are laid out by military actors, state actors, or uh, industry actors, uh, as well as most recently doing some work in the space of uh, algorithmic bias and, and developing uh, networks and, and coalitions for trying to build capacity around uh, policy interventions in that, in that domain. So as you can probably tell, uh, I, I've done a lot of different things and my, my thinking around how to do effective research and, and how to work effectively has, has changed a lot over the years. And nowadays, where I've landed is a focus on thinking about impact, action, and values. And so this, this most recent work and, and, and the work that I've been planning and, and that I hope will, will layer with my course leadership in this program is centered around the really core issues of dismantling white supremacy, which following the murder of George Floyd over, over the summer, I think has been on a lot of people's minds, uh, as well as a, a, uh, and borrowing uh, Noah Farah's Leahy's uh, pairing here of dismantling white supremacy and smashing the patriarchy, which I think is uh, another crucial goal uh, in, in today's world. And bringing these values and orientations to bear in, in the work that I do by asking the key questions of who is benefiting from the work that I'm doing, who is my work in solidarity with, and how does my work shift power? And so I've been talking about the, the research that I've done, and I ask those questions about my own research, uh, but I also hope to ask those same questions about the MA Internet Equalities Program and what I'm doing as far as a course leader for all of you. So give you a little bit of a, a sampling just of some various projects that I think might, might, might be of interest. Uh, one recent project that I've been doing in collaboration with Shole Krum, who's a, currently a PhD student at Johns Hopkins University, is around integrating considerations of structural power and historical contingency into computational frameworks of social behavior. And so you can see from this example perhaps how the, the types of critical lenses that, that I've been studying of late using tools from uh, feminist epistemology, uh, fr from historical materialism and, and Marxist thought, and bring those to bear in the analysis of, in this case, actually cognitive models, models from cognitive science, as well as models from AI and machine learning. In a different kind of project, which is more outwardly oriented, I've been looking at the issue of funding and conflicts of interest due to funding relationships in academic human computer interaction and digital studies. In this project, the group that I mentioned a moment ago, Critplat, uh, did an action at one of the major 
computer science conferences called Computer Supported Cooperative Work. That's a, a human computer interaction conference in which we first had a panel uh, discussing this issue of conflicts of interest in, in funding relationships within, within academic computer science, and then did a uh, gorilla tabling next to the Facebook booth uh, to distribute pamphlets and zines uh, and spread awareness of these issues. Uh, on, on the slide here, you'll, you'll also see two images of uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk uh, done up in, in Mark Zuckerberg's case with the beard of Karl Marx, and in Elon Musk's case, the hair and eyeglasses of uh, Marxist philosopher uh, Antonio Gramsci. The reason that this latter uh, area is important is exemplified well by something that you might have recently seen in the news. That was the firing of Timnit Gebru from Google. Uh, Timnit, if you don't know, the story is one of the foremost researchers in the area of fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. And was laid off from Google because of a paper that she had written highlighting biases in AI as well as climate impacts of AI. And this has caused a major uproar in not just the technology community, but in people more broadly interested in how uh, to implement anti-racist practices in organizations uh, because of the way that Timnit was treated so unfairly. What this highlights to me is how an organization like Google uh, has so much influence over the type of research that it's producing and the, the potential uh, and really evident impact that that's had on the field and on the perceptions of, of Google itself amongst the public and amongst, importantly, policymakers. It also highlights how doing this kind of work can actually be really hard, especially in, in Timnit's case in an in industry context where uh, Timnit can, can be fired, whether it was legally or illegally, uh, due to the type of research that she's doing that is challenging these oppressive structures within Google or challenging the, the kinds of issues with the technologies that Google is producing. And so my recent work is also a pairing of simultaneously doing this technology research that illuminates and challenges these structures of oppression while also organizing to dismantle the structures that foreclose the possibility of this work. And so in order to be able to do this research and in order to be able to do this kind of work, there needs to be institutional change because the institutions that we currently have both in higher education as well as in the tech industry are, are pressuring me and other researchers in this space to, to work on things, topics that are less challenging. Uh, and so these paired activities of research and organizing, I orient around the values of anti-racism, intersectional feminism, and, and anti-oppression. So that's me and, and, and my personal work, uh, which, which I'd be happy to talk about more if, if you all have any questions during the discussion period of this, of this session. I also just wanted to say a little bit about what I think is unique about the MAE Equality, Internet Equalities Program. How I see the MA Internet Equalities Program is sitting at the intersection of technology, design, and activism. And I thought I'd pull just a few quotes here to further emphasize the kinds of values that I hope that the program will embody. You might have heard this Angela Davis quote, radical simply means grasping something at the roots. Of course, there is the old feminist adage, I don't actually know how to pronounce that word, uh, the personal is political. And I think this has been attributed to Dr. Martin Luther King, but I'm not actually sure if that attribution is, is accurate. None of us are free until we're all free. The type of students that I hope might be interested in this in this program, uh, and this is 
far from exclusive. I hope that I hope that uh, whatever your backgrounds here, we might be able to have a conversation about uh, how that fits, uh, how your background fits into what what this program could be. Uh, but top of mind for me when I was thinking about this were folks who are artists or designers or critical data scientists. Uh, I hope that we can achieve a globally diverse cohort and with folks who have a mix of theoretical, practical, pedagogical, technical, or scientific interests. In the program, the courses that are on offer cover a range of technical knowledge and know-how. Uh, Dr. Dr. Charlotte Webb will talk more about this momentarily, uh, but some of the areas that are covered include human-computer interaction, computer-supported collaborative work, artificial intelligence, feminist programming, science and technology studies, and fairness, accountability, and transparency in those areas. I also hope that you all can learn some practical skills from engaging in this program. And some of the practical skills that, that I hope you might learn include doing work that's aligned with your values, whether that's in tech or around tech or whatever you might choose to do, how to stay up to date on the latest goings on in the field. I think really importantly, and something that I don't know any other program that really elevates, I hope that you might also learn a little bit about organizing and, and how to organize around issues that are close to your own heart. And to do that by finding allies, knowing when to act, and various uh, organizing tactics. And finally, just how to survive in this crazy world that we're in. And I'm happy to talk again about any more of these during the discussion period. In terms of my own approach to, to pedagogy and, and the type of experience that I hope you all will have in the classroom in this program, I really want the material to be tailored to the interests of, of the cohort. I am imagining that we will have, for instance, perhaps uh, reading groups or one-off workshops that might help to create material for you that isn't planned in, in the courses themselves, but can help to do a little bit of on-the-fly uh, tailoring for, for what you're hoping to learn. And I hope that we can learn together and also learn from each other, because I think that, in my experience, we all have a lot more to learn from each other than you just do for me, from me, for instance, as, as you might find in a kind of traditional classroom environment. In terms of what kinds of jobs I think you, the MA Internet Equalities will, will best position you for, the way that I imagine this program is as having a, an emphasis outside of big tech. I think that there are positions in places like Google or Microsoft where you could, using the skills and using the knowledge that you obtain from this program, where you might be qualified for something like an AI ethics job or a tech ethics job. But there are also many, many organizations, many, many companies outside of those big five or so tech organizations where there are really exciting jobs and part of what I think my role is, is to highlight those opportunities to you all and to students who are interested in, in doing work that is more oriented towards the public good or the social good or, or the public interest. And so that includes things like design justice work and design for social good, uh, third sector roles, potentially jobs in organizing or tech organizing, as well as government and politics. I have been thinking about what kinds of career development uh, workshops or one-off events might be helpful for positioning you well in those different job markets. And these are draft ideas, and I, I think I hope that, that these are uh, refined through conversations with you all and understanding what your hopes and needs are. Uh, but, I do, but, but I do envision doing something along the lines of perhaps a resume or CV workshops, 
um, peer review of job applications, uh, practice interviews, or perhaps uh, a career fair, uh, and potentially in partnership with, with these kinds of third sector and other organizations. All that said, uh, even, even among the uh, big tech folks, there, there's a lot of interest in, in this kind of work. Uh, one quote here from Rachel Bean at Google Nest is, this course, could, this course would be beneficial for designers, engineers, creative technologists, product managers who are interested in bringing frameworks and methodology to build more equal products, platforms, and algorithms. And another here, more and more companies want to hire people who are mission-driven, able to recognize their privilege and cognizant of how the, design, the decisions of engineers and product designers manifest in society. Anything that can equip students with a deeper understanding of how the products they are building can have a discriminatory impact on users from the onset is welcome and very much needed. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Charlotte Webb. Thank you so much, Peaks. That was really fantastic to hear all of your perspectives. And I think it's really clear that your, your background and your positioning is just perfect, perfectly placed to run this course. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to also now share my screen. OK. So as you've already heard, um, the course will encourage students to be really actively working to oppose discrimination in techno-social systems and, and also to explore how those systems can be challenged through critical and creative practice. So that's sort of overarchingly what, what students on this course will be doing, but I'm going to go into a bit more detail about how it's structured for you. So it's a 15 month program. It's running from October until December. And the course is broken into four terms, as you can see in this diagram. So in the first term, there'll be three parallel units. Firstly, intersectional internets. Secondly, methods for equitable technology development. And thirdly, feminist coding practices. So the intersectional internets unit will give you a kind of theoretical grounding in the course. So there'll be a chance to look at various different frameworks. They might include things like intersectional critical race technology studies, digital feminism, um, queer theory, maybe post-colonial science and technology studies. And it's a chance to really explore how those different frameworks provide lenses for understanding power and the internet. Um, I think it will also be a chance to look at how different forms of oppression intersect with each other, whether those are um, issues around racism, sexism, xenophobia, colonialism. Um, and also, as Peaks has touched on already, it's about looking at how creative and activist uh, practices can push back against those um, structures of oppression. So hopefully from the beginning of the course, you're already starting to get a sense of how that kind of theory and practice relationship can work um, really, really productively together. The next unit is called Methods for Equitable Technology Development. And this is going to be giving a methodological foundation for the rest of the course. So approaches that might be included here would be social and participatory design, various approaches to human computer interaction, including um, feminism, post-colonialism um, and others, uh, digital ethnography and design justice. And students will be um, testing some of those methods in class and also through their own independent creative practice and writing. The Feminist Coding Practices Unit will give some foundations in computing skills, but really importantly, frame those in feminist terms. Um, this is one of the areas I'm most excited to see um, the evolution of. It, it's about, I think, exploring how can we understand the internet and coding uh, or computing as an embodied practice? 
Um, how do we think about the politics of coding communities? Um, can we foreground the ways that um, perhaps women have been fundamentally involved throughout the history of computing in ways that aren't, aren't always foregrounded? Um, how can we explore pushing back against binaries, including gender binaries, when we're thinking about code? And also, of course, this is about encouraging some technical fluency at the beginning of the course. So um, I think this is a fairly open open unit, so I don't want to say too much about exactly what you'll be doing, but it might be things like, for example, um, implementing and modifying simple databases, experimenting with algorithms, exploring data, exploring digital methods. So in the second term, you will have uh, a couple of options for units that you can take. So you can either choose to go for computational inequalities or designing for responsible innovation. So the computational inequalities unit is about exploring the histories and practices and sort of social and economic cases for um, Sorry, I'm talking about the wrong unit there. Computational inequalities is about computational bias, right? So the histories and context of that, how those things can in, um, exist in computational systems and also the data that they are trained on. So that might be explored in the context of facial recognition. It might be explored in the context of biometric systems, recruitment algorithms, all these different spaces that we see computational bias emerging. And students will have a chance to sort of explore creative ways to reimagine those systems and, and you'll be guided through that process by the tutors. Um, and I think this is going to be quite a practical and hands-on unit that um, develops on very uh, clearly from the feminist coding. So then, Designing for responsible innovation. So this is about exploring the history and practices of responsible innovation. What are the kind of social cases for working in that way? What can the role of responsible innovation be for building a more equitable society? And what? how do we need to critique the very field of responsible innovation? What are some of the pitfalls there? Um, what do we really mean when we talk about responsible innovation? Are we talking about something that um, is innovative towards more democratic uh, social relations, something that's able to facilitate more equitable relations and can be sustainable. Um, I think there will also be discussions around workplace equality in this unit. And um, so students will be learning about sort of strategies for change, looking at social and political entrepreneurship, for example, and also um, how can the activist work that Peaks was talking about earlier sort of feed into all of that? So whilst all of that's going on, students will also be taking a longer human rights and computation unit. This is um, one of the, well, it's the longest unit on the course and it's going to run over 20 weeks. Um, so this is about the, the roles that technology companies and governments regulators, civil society and the law have in protecting human rights. Um, and those rights include freedom of expression, privacy and safety on the internet, and students will be looking at um, online human rights violations, internet legislation and regulation, data protection and privacy. Um, we'll also be exploring how artists, activists, civil society have developed um, countermeasures to tackle human rights violations in online spaces and this will be a chance to design a sort of activist project or um, to organize um, in a way that adv advocates for the protection or enhancement of human rights as they do relate to the internet. So the, the final taught unit is called Platform Potentials, and this focuses on the role of internet platforms, cultures and communities in bringing about social change. So this is going to be a chance to hear from artists and activ activists, initiators of online and offline movements to really sort of examine current practices of community empowerment, organization, collective resistance, subversion, activism. 
They're going to be exploring the tactics and goals of internet activism. And I think importantly, looking at how that relates to offline activist work, um, looking at successful movements um, and learning um, strategies for how to effect sort of coordinated change. There are already some videos that we created over the summer which discuss in more depth some of the issues in these individual units. So you can check them out on the CCI's YouTube channel if you would like to. And then finally, finally, after all of the taught units um, and over the rest of the course, um, students are going to be developing an advanced major project and uh, they'll also be writing an associated thesis. And that's going to be addressing an internet equality, um, something that has become dear to you and that sort of feels right for you to write about as you as you think about maybe where you want to go um, with everything that you've learned. Um, so it's really a chance to kind of dig deep and and figure out what most resonates with your own practice. Um, and so just finally, in terms of learning and teaching, um, the, the, the culture at the CCI is very open, very collaborative, interdisciplinary, and, and students will have access to quite a wide range of staff, colleagues, there's lots of expertise and lots of different disciplinary backgrounds in the CCI, which is one of the things that I think makes it so incredible. Um, and in, as well as that, the sort of learning and teaching approaches on the course, and I think you already got a sense of this from Peaks, will be quite varied. So there will be lectures and seminars, critiques and visits, class-based workshops and assignments, importantly, group work and peer learning individual and group tutorials and presentations. So quite a varied mix of approaches there. And um, hopefully that means that there's there's lots of modes for people to engage with depending on sort of what works for them. Um, there's a range of assessment methods throughout the course as well. So um, there's critical writing that's um, uh, delivered in the form of um, blog posts as well as the, the thesis work. There'll be portfolio work and individual and group presentations and projects. And I think, again, it's just really important to highlight how throughout the whole course, there'll be lots of opportunities to collaborate and work with peers and support each other through the whole sort of learning journey. Um, so finally, some information on how to apply. Firstly, it's really important to say that the CCI is a community of and in solidarity with people from every gender, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, language, you know, neurotype, size, ability, religion, culture, subculture. And we really do want to encourage applications from as wide a, a, a range of people as possible. So um, that's really important to say. There's, there's no coding skills required to apply for this course. Um, you will need to complete an online form as well as um, submit a CV and a personal statement. And um, the statement asks you to demonstrate a rationale for why you want to join the course, how you think it might help you progress in your career, as well as um, to demonstrate, I guess, a critical engagement with the, the topics of the course as well. So the deadline's on the 15th of May 2021 and um, we really, really hope that you're interested and that you would like to apply. Um, and I think that's it from me. Um, and I'm going to now hand over to Georgina, who's going to play as a video from some former students who have been engaged in work at the CCI. Um, called Maria and Sophia and so thank you so much for listening and I'll be on the chat for questions. Hi my name is Sophia and I'm one-fourth of Ricebox Studio. Hi my name is Maria and I'm also one-fourth of Ricebox Studio and the two of us were participants on the Designing a Feminist Alexa workshop back in 2018. So Ricebox Studio uses creative technology for social good um, so just to give you a bit of background on Ricebox and the projects we've done, we recently finished like a period education campaign, which invo involved like an educational book. We also um, 
which also included like interviews from like religious leaders, like to gain cultural perspectives. We also had a lot of crowdsourced stories, which we collected. We we kind of crowdsourced and asked people to submit from like all around the world because we know that we want to hear voices of other people. We want to share experiences and narratives from different communities, which is really important for us to kind of is a running theme within our work. Um, and so participating in the feminist internet workshop was honestly integral in um, kind of sparking our personal interest in inequalities present uh, in online spaces. So as a Muslim Indian, visible Muslim Indian woman of color, um, I'm always critically exploring kind of the biases and inequalities that we have that, you know, the systematic discrimination within society and education. Um, and these are topics that we focus on as a studio, but the Feminist Internet Workshop really helped me kind of get aware of how these inequalities which exist in the social sphere are then translated and transferred into a more virtual kind of virtual spaces as well. Um, it, it made me realize that, you know, these spaces and algorithms are developed by people. These people have biases, um, you know, biases and stereotypes of gender, race, sexuality, religion, class, whatever. Um, and these are transferred into the things they're making, the code that they're writing, which then impacts marginalized communities. Um, so, yeah, the workshop was only three days, but the, the kind of personal impact it had on us was like far more long lasting. And the best highlight was that um, we got to meet Alex Fafega, who is the founder and head creative technologist at Kamuzi. And he is very kindly part of um, the Ricebox Studio Advisory Board, uh, which is really lucky for us as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> and then uh, we're just gonna talk a little bit about the feminist principles that we brought across from the workshop that we did and our experiences and how that's kind of um, how that sits within our design process. So uh, some of the things like obviously Feminist Internet, the workshop, designing a feminist Alexa workshop uh, made us realize that we need to check our biases. Like these are unconscious biases that really, really influence the way we work and we need to check them. Uh, it made us aware of how these biases have impact on the way we think and how we design, which is really, really important, especially when you're making public facing work like the implications that this can have on marginalized communities is really, really, it's just something you always need to question because you don't want to kind of reinforce any negative stereotypes that, over, that already exist. Um, you know, you just don't want to do more harm than good. So at Ricebox Studios, when we do a, a project that has to do with, um, that, 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 is, that is reaching certain marginalized communities, um, if it's about experiences that we're not necessarily that we haven't necessarily lived through personally in our lives uh we always you know take into account whether or not it is our place whether or not it is the most appropriate we are the most appropriate people to be discussing these topics or trying to design whatever outcome based on that topic so um, after doing the Fantasy Set workshop, you know, we took that in account, this, this aspect that maybe you're not the right person to do this project. And so we always make an effort to try and reach out and get testimonies or even just involve the right people directly at the right stage uh, when it comes to developing those type of projects. Another thing that we also took in account when it comes to collaborations, especially collaborating with uh, local artists or local community groups, um is basically always give more than you take always prioritize how you can help them um before you ask for them to help you to develop an aspect of your project we're able to highlight specific issues through alternative and artistic means and therefore we will always be mindful of how we can serve our community better uh, something that we were taught about during the uh, workshop is the PIA standards. So um, things like team bias and how our value and position in society makes us look at things and how we make decisions, um, as well as design and representation. So kind of questions of values that we have and then what values we want to embed into our work. And then lastly, um, something that I learned from Charlotte actually was that citation is a really, really good part of feminist practice 
Um, so it's kind of the idea of not gatekeeping, sharing and promoting your resources, which is something that we're always, always trying to do with like the platform <laughs> that we have, um, say like on Instagram and as well as our newsletter, if you would like to sign up. And we're always trying to share like really cool things happening in our communities, um, you know, within tech, education, design, like just trying to um, kind of share and shout about other things that are happening outside, I guess, the design, the echo chambers of, you know, European design. Yeah. In addition to everything she just said, when it comes to the Ricebox design process, we take uh, user feedback very, very seriously. Um, so there's always a part in our process where we always make sure to uh, deploy the prototype to um, a group of users that can then test it. And we can then you know, take into account all the feedback that comes, especially from people that are not um, necessarily from a uh, mainstream community. So why do we think a course like MA Internet Equalities is important? So since the course explores how power relations are organized, embedded and perpetuated in internet technologies um, and viewing kind of like the, how they can be reorganized and challenged through critical artistic and creative practices, you will get to dive in a lot of existing algorithmic biases within everyday softwares, tools and apps, which often perpetuate systematic, repeatable and often unfair outcomes. So as this course delves directly into these biases, uh, as makers, artists and citizens of the future, it is part of our social responsibility to be aware of these issues if we wish to make the world a better place. In addition to that, um, you will also be forced to look into your own biases, your own presumptions, and you will be critical of your own personal experiences and perspectives on, varial, on various social political issues. Uh, that's an essential step for you to become aware of the damage that, you know, that as people we are capable of doing around us. So this type of course allows for everyone in that course to understand that critical side, which is often secondary in our minds. This time, it's something you will think of as, as the forefront of, of, the, of using the product. Um, and although the MA is closer to critical theory um, than an art course, it's still happening at an art university. So you'll be around artistic and creative mindsets, which will give you the chance to dive into both your artistic and academic mindset, which is pretty good. So finally, what advice would we give to someone thinking about studying the course? Always be honest with yourself, check your biases. That is one of the most difficult things to do. It is very challenging to be able to admit to yourself that actually maybe you were inappropriate or that you had uh, you know, racially set insensitive thoughts uh, at some point in your life. It's easy to look at someone else's like facial recognition tool and then criticize it for its algorithmic bias while simultaneously being unaware of your own biases, you know, in your mind or in whatever app you might be developing. And look into both mainstream and alternative forms of communication. Chances are some of you are artists or surrounded by people with artistic mindsets. So use that creativity as much as possible when it comes to exploring uh, ways of reaching audiences, but also creating impact in unique ways. So yeah, I think that was uh, us, Ricebox, um, in terms of uh, advice and our perspectives on the ME Internet Equalities course. So yeah, um, we all hope that you will do it just because it really opened our minds both uh, in terms of personal processes uh, and both in terms of like how we run our studio as well. And we highly recommend people to just even look up some of the resources that this course shares or that UELCCI shares in general as they're very relevant in some of the issues of today. Definitely. Right. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Follow us on Instagram. Hello again, sending a huge thank you to Maria and Sophia for this lovely video. I loved hearing how they just brought all the things that they learned in the feminist internet workshops into their practice that you could example of what we're trying to do with the MA entities. And I would like to invite Charlotte and Pix into this virtual space. We have a few minutes left for any questions that you might have about the course or the CCI. So this is your chance really to 
to share whatever thoughts you have, comments, um, doubts, and we'll do we'll do our best to to copy them. So yeah, please send them through on the chat on the right corner of of Blackboard. And yeah, in the meantime, is there anything else you would like to share, Charlotte or Pix, about the presentations or what we've just seen on the video? Actually, I have a question for you, Charlotte. Oh, I have a question for you too. <laughs> Go for it. When do the applications open? Oh, they're already open. Oh, wonderful. Open. Yeah, yeah. So you got between now and the 15th of May. I, I have a question too um, for you, Peaks, but also everyone. I guess I really loved the point that was raised in the video there by Maria about how sometimes it can be so hard to confront your own bias or maybe even confront, you know, your complicity in um, structures of oppression or something like that. And I just, I wondered if you had any thoughts about how we can support each other through this process as we, as we have to face up to some of those really difficult challenges. It's really, it's a really tough and important question. I see there's a much simpler question that maybe that maybe you have the answer to, uh, just to to make sure we're getting logistics out of the way, and then I'll then I'll address that question. Do do you know has has the course got a part time option? So at the moment it's full time, but that's not to say that in the future it might be possible to create a part time mode. But at the moment it's full time. Thanks for the quick question there. Um, yeah, I think that it's it's a it's a really it's a it's a really important question how to how to support each other and how to do better and and help each other do better. Uh, one one thing that that I've recently been thinking about and 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 that that I hope would would have a place in this program is 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 structures for holding each other accountable. Uh, I don't know if you ever, if you've, if you've um, participated in any um, like uh, anti-racism groups for white people. The, the, there's this, there's an activity in, in that kind of uh, social justice group where, where you might start, start a, an event by saying, you know, this is what I've done this week. Like this is an anti-racist action that, that I've done this week. Uh, or you might commit to something. Uh, and so just having that group context where where it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to be honest with each other, but also to set an intention and to hold each other to that intention. I think it would be interesting to try to do something like that. Thank you. I'm just answering. Um, I love that too. Um, so Abby, I checked this yesterday and basically on the, on the UAL side, there isn't a, um, you'll be notified about your your place by X date. It's kind of on a rolling basis. And they also don't specify the turnaround time because um, courses can have quite different numbers of applications. But I think in this case, it shouldn't take too long um, to hear a response. I think um, if you can, if you're concerned about sort of logistical stuff, I just apply as soon as you possibly can. And that gives you the the, the best chance of getting having that time period. But you can also email um, the CCI to just um, flag that that's an issue. And, and then might be, it might be possible um, to get a better sense from the Dean about the turnaround time. So yeah, drop the CCI an email if you, if you want to still pursue that question. Cool. Thank you so much for joining. Amazing. Yeah, I guess we made it to the end of the session. So unless we have another question coming through from attendees. Um, yes, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Abby.
Amazing. Amazing. Okay, so yeah, just just a quick note to say that we have other open day sessions coming up in the next um, in the next week, and we are also running the MSc Creative Computing Graduate Showcase on Thursday and and Friday, and that's a very good chance as well to see what sort of cohorts are going to be studying, you know, amongst amongst your group at the CCI and the sort of projects that are developed. And, and yeah, if you just want to hear a bit more about students' work, uh, feel free to join us. Um, the event is on our Eventbrite page at the CCI. And yes, thanks thanks a lot, Charlotte and Pix, for this wonderful presentation. It was lovely to hear from you. And yes, we'll see you all online very soon, hopefully. Thanks all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.